Well, welcome everyone to another one of Hydra Terra's webinar series. It's great to have so many people here today. It's uh, fantastic. Um, today, our topic is around landfill leachate collection, treatment, and monitoring. I'll just run through a bit of an outline of that. So our guest speaker today is Tyson Klingham, and he's technical director and principal from Mackenzie Environmental. Tyson's a true landfill specialist, and uh, he's also a chartered environmental and civil engineer. Uh, he's got approximately 14 years experience working on landfills, and we're really lucky to have him here today to tell us about all his learnings dealing with the design of landfills and the leachate management side of things. We've got to know Tyson over the years, working with him as a subcontractor on various projects, and he's a great uh, person to work with. So thanks very much for joining us today, Tyson. Really appreciate it. Well, the, the second part of the presentation will be from myself, talking about uh, leachate monitoring, which is something that... Uh, Hydroterra has done a lot of work in as well. So um, a pretty full day of information coming your way today. Before we charge into things, um, we love your questions. And just a, a note, thank you so much for all those early bird questions. We had, uh, we've had 10 questions already. So we'll try and leave enough time in Q&A to address those. Some of those questions will be addressed um, as uh, part of the presentation itself um, and others will be addressed at the end. But um, please uh, log your questions as you go so we'll, and we'll do our best to answer those. Any questions we can't get to during the session, uh, we'll get back in touch with you by email to give you some answers on those. Um, so to raise a question, use the Q&A button and type your questions in there. And at the end, I'll read them out and Tyson and I will do our best to answer them. Why does Hydroterra run these webinar series? Well, uh, we like to share knowledge and they seem to be getting more and more popular. So uh, we're really enjoying running them. Um, we also seem to have a lot of people passionate about sharing their knowledge, which is fantastic in our industry. So really enjoying being involved in this process. Um, we're also trying to facilitate education. You know, it's, um, it's an area where there's probably a lack of uh, good applied training in some aspects of the sort of real world. And uh, all the people in consulting know how difficult it is to get time to pass on their knowledge. So uh, I think we're helping to facilitate passing on some of this knowledge. Um, and finally, we like to see ourselves as a bit of an industry leader in helping with linking up technologies and people's knowledge. So they're the real drivers behind why we're here today. All right, so the topic of the day. So Tyson's going to talk to us about leachate collection at modern best practice landfills, leachate collection at historical closed landfills, leachate treatment and disposal, including evaporation, nitrification, disposal to sewer. And most importantly, is going to give us some case studies of how all this knowledge has been applied. I'm going to talk to you about leachate monitoring technologies, best practice application, and monitoring case studies of landfills as well. Finally, we'll do our Q&A session. So without further ado, I'd like to pass over to you, Tyson. Thanks, Richard. And thanks for everyone for uh, joining us today. So as Richard said, I'll be talking about uh, landfill leachate collection and treatment. Um, and the collection side of things, I've broken that down into um, more modern best practice line landfills, where you have a uh, leachate collection system. And then also looking at older landfills, unlined landfills, where you don't have a uh, proper leachate collection system and there's the need to uh, retrofit and install wells, that type of thing. 
Uh, then I'll be looking at leachate treatment um, and a few common treatment methods that I've been involved in. And finally, a few case studies. So firstly, I thought I'd talk a little bit about um, why do we extract and treat leachate? Uh, well, obviously it's to protect the environment, uh, mainly the groundwater and surface water environment. Um, I've got a few dot points up there on I guess, more the technical side of it, um, how that's achieved. So in a lime landfill, the reason we need to extract leachate is to minimise the head on the liner. So even the best liners leak, there's no such thing as an impermeable liner. So we need to minimise that depth of leachate above the liner to reduce that leachate seepage rate through the liner. Uh, looking at unlined landfills above groundwater, similarly, it's about reducing the leachate head to, again, minimise any seepage through the base of the landfill to groundwater. Uh, and the third point I've got there is unlined landfills below groundwater. Um, obviously, you can never completely lower leachate there, but the idea is we're creating an inward hydraulic gradient to minimise the uh, flow of contaminants off-site. There's a few other reasons, obviously, why we extract leachate as well. Um, for example, to manage landfill gas, um, because we can't extract landfill gas if the landfill is flooded with leachate. Uh, next slide, thanks, Richard. Okay. Leachate collection at line landfills. So, this aspect of uh, leachate collection is, I guess, very mature in the industry, um, very well understood. We've got a lot of uh, regulation around this, and uh, most in the industry are pretty familiar with what's required. So I've got a little cross section up there on my slide uh, from the Victorian Landfill Best Practice Guidelines, otherwise known as the BEPM. Uh, and I won't go into the lining system there, but above the lining system, uh, we have the leachate collection system, which typically comprises uh, a 300 mil thick layer of leachate drainage aggregate. So that's a free draining aggregate with uh, minimum fines. Network of leachate collection pipes, uh, typically polyethylene pipes that are drilled or slotted. Um, to collect the leachate. And that's covered by a separation geotextile. So those are the three main components in the leachate collection system to collect leachate and uh, take it off to a leachate sump. Um, the other aspect of leachate collection system design is the gradients of the liner, which sorry, I just said on the previous slide there, Richard. Um, so typically the minimum grades are 3% grade to the leachate collection pipes and, and then the pipes grading at minimum 1% to the sump. Um, so they're the minimum specified in the BEPM and it's pretty similar in most states across the country. Um, anything flatter than that and you risk the leachate head uh, building up because the flow to the sump will be slower. So once the leachate enters the leachate collection system, uh, the liner grades to a low point where there is a leachate collection sump. Um, so I've got a little cross section of a design on this slide and um, a photo of one in construction there. So the leachate sump, sorry about the dog barking in the background there. <laughs> Uh, the leachate sample is typically about a metre deep, low point of the liner, uh, with a large diameter riser pipe extending up the side liner of the landfill. There's a leachate pump installed down that riser pipe uh, to extract leachate. There's a couple of different arrangements you can have with leachate sumps. Um, the one we're looking at there is inclined or installed on the side liner. And the alternative to that is a vertical riser pipe, which extends um, just straight up through the waste. So there's pros and cons to each of these uh, types of riser pipes. Um, 
Personally, my preference is an inclined riser pipe that we're looking at there in this slide, up the side liner. The advantages of those are it's installed all in one piece um, through construction. So there's no need to extend that throughout the life of the landfill. It's out of the way of the landfilling operations. So you don't have uh, plant and equipment running into it, uh, trucks running over it, that sort of thing. And the pump gets installed once and it can remain there for the life of the landfill. Uh, apart from obviously maintenance side of things, um, but it's installed once and it's there. Also all the pipe work for the pumps, um, so that's compressed air to power the pump, leachate conveyance pipes, that's all installed at the top of the riser pipe and it's outside of your landfill area, so it's uh, less likely to be damaged and doesn't need to be moved during landfilling. So the alternative being the vertical riser pipe, which sticks uh, directly up um, through the waste. Sometimes they're unavoidable, uh, but they do have a few more issues in my uh, point of view. Uh, so that is they can obviously be hit and knocked around by landfilling equipment um, during waste placements. So there's the busy, busy sites, these landfills with uh, many, many trucks, landfill compactors, heavy equipment working around them. Uh, there's a need to extend the riser pipe with every lift of waste. So you're coming back very regularly, adding another couple of metres of pipe onto the riser pipe to extend it up as the waste is filled in the cell. And then there's a need to install and remove the leachate pump and associated pipe work each time that riser is being raised. So it's a bit more fiddly um, during landfilling. Uh, next slide, thanks Richard. So that's uh, a summary of leachate collection at uh, best practice landfills. As I said, it's um, pretty standard across most sites as well understood, well regulated, um, minimum requirements there. Once we enter leachate extraction at uh, unlined landfills and older closed landfills, things get a bit more interesting and uh, a bit trickier. Uh, all sorts of different complications we need to overcome and there's no um, real set guidelines or uh, methods for this. So the typical method of extracting leachate from an unlined landfill without a leachate collection system is installation of leachate extraction wells. So they're wells typically drilled vertically into the waste um, until the leachate is intercepted. There are examples of horizontal wells, but um, by far vertical wells are the most common. Often these wells are combined landfill gas and leachate extraction wells. So in that case, the casing of the wells are perforated. Um, and I guess the bottom part of the well that is below the leachate level is used to extract leachate and there's a pump installed down the well um, to extract that leachate. And then the top half of the well, or top part where there's no leachate, uh, is where the land, landfill gas can be extracted. So dual wells, they're very useful. Um, so as I mentioned, these wells are fitted with uh, pumps, similar to at a best practice line landfill. And these wells are typically pneumatic or air-powered pumps. Uh, next slide, thanks Richard. So, leachate extraction online landfills, lots of challenges, as I said. Um, there's no, it's different at every site. Uh, and I've listed a few of the different challenges there that I've run into over the years. Um, small radius of influence due to low hydraulic conductivity of waste is a common issue. So typically waste isn't very permeable and that depends on the type of waste and the type of cover material that was used during landfilling. Uh, but typically the waste and the cover is, you know, is compacted in to maximise the amount of waste you get into the landfill and daily cover is applied over the waste each day. So there's a lot of soil and if that soil is uh, low hydraulic conductivity, it can be difficult to 
extract the leachate. So a small radius of influence means we need lots and lots of wells and lots of pumps. Uh, and that means lots of pipe work all across the site, um, high installation costs and lots of maintenance required. The other thing there with the uh, low hydraulic conductivity of the waste means it can take uh, many years to lower the leachate levels. So one side I'm involved in the minute, um, they've been extracting leachate for more than five years and they're still working towards their target levels. So it's not a short-term fix. Uh, next slide, thanks Richard. So a few of the issues I've come across, uh, I'm trying to extract leachate from unlined landfills. Uh, the first one I've got there is waste settlement. So the depth of waste in landfills varies greatly. Um, but some recent landfills I've been working in where we've been extracting leachate from an unlined landfill, uh, I've got depths of waste up to around 50 metres. And particularly where that waste has been recently placed, you can get a lot of settlement in the first uh, few years. After that, it tends to slow down, um, but settlement will continue for decades. So the settlement can cause wells, the casing of wells to bend or kink. Um, if the, because the casing, I guess, is sort of fixed while the waste is settling down and the forces on that can cause bends. The issue we get there is pumps become stuck or the casing itself um, completely kinks and that well becomes redundant. Uh, other issues we've come across is silting of wells. Um, this is a particular issue we've come across at one site, which was a former sand quarry and the fine sands that were left at the site were used for cover material in the, uh, as daily cover, sorry, on the waste. And so that material has uh, migrates into the wells as leachate's being extracted and can settle in the base of the well above the pump, causing pumps to become stuck. The third dot point I've got there is uh, waste settlement again, um, but this time damage to the compressed air and leachate conveyance pipes that go to each pump. So these pipes are typically installed in the capping layers of the landfill. And there's a compressed air pipe to each pump to power the pump and a leachate conveyance pipe from each pump to convey the leachate to wherever you're pumping it to, typically a leachate pond. So where you get a lot of waste settlement, uh, the cap settles as well. And if there's differential settlement, that can cause uh, damage to those pipes and um, breaks or kinking in those pipes. Fourth issue I've got uh, now there is then silting again, but this time again, the leachate conveyance pipes. So the pumps that we use for extracting leachate, um, many of these pumps, tend to handle the silt very well, but they do pump the silt um, along with the leachate. Uh, so there's a need to have infrastructure along those pipelines to collect the silt so it doesn't block the pipes. And the last one I've noted there is when you have lots of uh, penetrations through the, lots of wells, wells, there's lots of penetrations through the landfill cap. And every penetration through your cap is another potential point for landfill gas emissions that needs to be managed. Thanks, Richard. Um, next one I've got here is a case study of an unlined landfill, uh, leachate extraction. So this is the Clayton Regional Landfill, which is in the southeastern suburbs of Melbourne. Uh, this area of Melbourne was a sand mining area um, and most of those sand mines subsequently became landfills. So there's at least uh, 10 or more old landfills in this area. This site is a former sand quarry. It extends to more than 20 metres below the natural groundwater level. Uh, most of the northern half of this site was unlined they lined it with what they called a uh, slimes liner. Slimes being the 
silty fine clay material that's left over from the sand washing um, operations when these sites were sand quarries. So that slime material was placed down on the base and sides of this landfill in the older cells to form a quasi liner um, that effectively it's unlined in connection with groundwater. Uh, the southern part of this site had landfill cells, two cells lined to best practice standards. Uh, however, those cells, the leachate collection systems failed and the cells essentially were allowed to fill with leachate due to failure of the leachate collection system and a bit of poor management. So when we got involved in this site, essentially both the north and the southern parts of the site had similar leachate levels. Um, it was, the levels are similar to surrounding groundwater. So this site, when we got involved, um, had some leachate extraction, but it was clear it needed uh, some more. So the first step was a hydrogeological assessment, which included some leachate pumping trials. The objectives of that assessment were to assess the hydraulic conductivity of the waste, uh, assess the radius of influence of leachate extraction wells. And that information was used to undertake some modeling to look at how many wells would be needed to draw down leachate in this landfill and how long that might take. The outcome of that was some upgrades to the leachate extraction system, included drilling of additional wells, installation of additional leachate pumps, and upgrading a lot of the other infrastructure across the site, which include replacing compressed air pipe networks, leachate conveyance pipes, um, and replacing air compressor infrastructure. Uh, so this site now is working towards achieving uh, target leachate levels. They're being achieved across about half of the site, uh, but we found that it's very variable uh, due to varying hydraulic conductivity of the waste and the interconnectedness varying across the landfill. So we found in some areas, the leachate levels responded quite quickly to pumping. In other areas, it's taking a lot longer and it may take several years for the target leachate levels to be achieved. Um, some of the other things to note on a site like this are uh, with 77 leachate extraction pumps. That's a lot of pumps to uh, maintain and operate. Uh, on this site, we monitor the pumps on a weekly basis, and that's to check that the pumps are operating as they should be, check there's no issues, no leachate leaks, compressed air leaks, or landfill gas leaks at the wells. And then this is a site where we've had a lot of issues with silting of the wells and leachate pumps becoming stuck. Um, so to try and overcome that, the pumps are raised a couple of metres in the well, and we do that every three months. So it's just lifting the pump up to try and dislodge any silt before the pump becomes stuck and irretrievable. Um, so next we'll move on to talking about leachate treatment. So once we've extracted the leachate from the landfill, it needs to go somewhere. The main, the three common methods of leachate treatment and disposal that I'll um, cover are evaporation, leachate treatment plants, so it's on-site treatment plants at landfills, and disposal to sewer. So evaporation is common at small landfills uh, where there's not large volumes of leachate generated. Once you get to a larger landfills and or wetter climates, that's when on-site leachate treatment plants are typically needed. And they're typically in conjunction with um, disposing to sewer. So there'll be some treatment normally needed before the leachate can be pumped off to sewer. 
So firstly, evaporation. As I mentioned, most common form of treatment at smaller landfills um, on the Victorian based and pretty well every uh, rural landfill in Victoria would have a leachate pond where leachate is evaporated. And I'm sure it's similar across much of the country. Obviously it only works in dry climates. So I've got a couple of um, maps on the slide here from the Bureau of Meteorology. Uh, one of average general rainfall and another of average evaporation. So in any climates where you don't have a uh, significantly higher evaporation than rainfall, clearly evaporation from a pond just isn't going to work. Brings me on to the third point there, uh, that can require very large ponds. So if you're only getting a few hundred millimetres of evaporation um, in addition to the rainfall a year, then large ponds are needed. And there comes a point where larger and larger ponds uh, is just not feasible. Other options are enhanced evaporation. That's one that I don't have a lot of experience with and don't run into it a lot. Um, I have seen it used here and there at some sites, uh, but as far as I've seen, it hasn't um, taken off. And enhanced evaporation can include various things, um, different types of sprayers to try and increase evaporation. Uh, there's other methods of um, heating or burning off the leachate. As I said, I haven't come across too many of those. Another common form of evaporation at some of these sites is dust suppression in the active landfill cell. So at some landfills, they'll fill up leachate in a water cart and spray that around your active landfill cell um, in the dry months. And that's one way of um, really enhancing the amount of evaporation that you can get. And then the last um, thing I'll touch on with evaporation is lack of capacity during wet periods. So as I mentioned, most of the sites I'm involved in all have uh, leachate evaporation ponds, which were working great um, during dry periods. Um, over my career when I started, we were in drought for several years. Everything was going along quite fine. And then 2010-11, it started to rain in Victoria and suddenly everyone had a leachate problem. Um, since that time, there's been a lot of upgrades, most sites to you know, increase leachate storage and treatment capacity. And then the last thing I'll touch on there is once you run out of capacity of site, often the uh, only contingency is trucking off site. And that's something that you want to avoid at all costs because it is extremely expensive. Next one I'll talk about is on-site leachate treatment plants. So leachate treatment plants are common at larger landfills, so larger municipal landfills, and particularly in wetter climates. So leachate treatment plants are typically used to treat ammonia via nitrification and also reduce the BOD load prior to discharge to sewer. Obviously, there's a range of different contaminants and chemicals in leachate. Uh, however, the ammonia and BOD are the one, the key uh, chemicals that we're treating prior to it being disposed. So I've listed there some of the key requirements for nitrification at one of these treat treatment plants. So the first thing we need is the nitrifying bacteria. So they're the bacteria that convert ammonia into nitrite and nitrate. These bacteria are naturally occurring, they're everywhere. Um, however, typically at a landfill leachate treatment plant, the plant will be seeded with some bacteria from a municipal wastewater treatment plant in the form of a sludge to seed the plant to get the um, nitrification process kick-started more rapidly. The second thing we need is a source of dissolved oxygen for those bacteria. Now that's typically supplied using aerators. Uh, the most common I've come across are mechanical floating aerators. 
and they provide a source of oxygen. Thirdly, there is temperature. Um, so being a biological process, it's temperature dependent. Um, the temperatures quoted for nitrification, the optimum temperatures are out somewhere around 30 degrees. Uh, in my part of the world, it's the water temperature is a lot lower than that most of the year. In summer, um, water temperatures are in the 20s, which is fine for nitrification. Winter, once you start to get down below 10 degrees, nitrification slows down significantly. So we find during winter months, um, we have more storage capacity due to the uh, decrease in treatment rate. And the fourth thing I've got there is alkalinity. Um, the bacteria consume alkalinity in the treatment process. So there needs to be a source of alkalinity for nitrification to occur. Um, luckily, landfill leachate is typically high in alkalinity. So at some sites, there's sufficient alkalinity to not require any uh, dosing of chemicals. Um, the straight chemical equations would say you need seven parts alkalinity to treat one part ammonia. So if you've got landfill leachate with 1,000 milligrams per litre ammonia and 7,000 milligrams per litre alkalinity, um, you should be fine. If it's less than seven parts, there may be a need to dose some alkalinity. Um, that's typically dosed in the form of uh, sodium hydroxide or magnesium hydroxide, which is the same type of chemicals that are used at um, municipal wastewater treatment plants. So that's a bit of a summary of the nitrification process itself um, that we typically undertake before leachate is disposed to sewer. Um, so the second step, disposing to sewer, that's done under a trade waste agreement with the local water authority. Um, the water authorities will have a range of acceptance criteria. Um, it's a very long, long list of criteria, but the key for landfills are typically ammonia, inhibition, TDS load, and then potentially some other chemicals like PFAS. Um, so firstly, pH, um, easy to manage. Typically there'll be criteria of uh, something like six to 10 or pH eight to 10. That's easy to manage before discharging by dosing with either an acid or adding alkalinity uh, to get your leachate within that range. Treatment of the ammonia, we've just gone through that in a bit more detail, so I'll just skip over that. Inhibition, is the next one that needs to be considered that we uh, run into as being sometimes an issue on some sites. Now inhibition is a measure of the impact that the landfill leachate has on the wastewater treatment plant. So the municipal wastewater treatment plant that is receiving the leachate. So the laboratory actually takes a sample of um, water or sludge from that treatment plant and they run a test to see how much the leachate inhibits uh, the treatment process. The tricky thing with inhibition, it's not a uh, chemical or property that's easily measured in the leachate. So if you do get high inhibition, it can be tricky to understand what's actually causing that. Next one is TDS load. Uh, Again, it's one that's typically not treated at the landfills I'm involved in. Um, I'm sure there are some out there that might have, um, say, a reverse osmosis or something like that. But generally, this is managed by a limit on the tedious load that can be discharged per day. So the wastewater authority will stipulate in the trade waste agreement, you can discharge no more than X uh, kilograms or tons of TDS per day. And then the discharge rate is limited to achieve that. And then there's other chemicals that can be an issue such as PFAS. So here in Victoria at least, the uh, wastewater authorities are including PFAS limits in the trade waste agreements. 
Uh, so we need to monitor and ensure we're under those limits. Hasn't been too much of an issue with the sites I've been involved in. Um, so I'm not aware of any sites yet that have specific PFAS treatment plants. Um, yeah. Other thing I mentioned there is um, the discharge process. So there's two common types of process, a continuous discharge or a batch discharge. So some sites, uh, the Water Authority will give approval for a continuous discharge, which is, as the name implies, essentially turn your pump on and discharge uh, whenever you like, assuming the leachate is within the discharge criteria. The second option, the batch discharge, is the one we come across the most. And in that, with that method, the Water Authority requires every treated batch of leachate to be tested in the laboratory and approved by the authority before it's discharged. Um, typically that requires uh, locking of the pond. So all valves in and out of the pond will be locked and they can't be unlocked and the pump turned on until the water authority is given approval. And then there's a sampling and approval process uh, to allow that batch discharge to occur. So typically that involves sampling of the treated leachate under the supervision of a representative from the Water Authority, um, and then assessment of those results, send them off to the Water Authority for approval. So that's a summary of the process of disposing to sewer. I'll move on now to a case study of a site I'm involved in. So this is the Clayton Regional Landfill again. Um, so we're in the southeast suburbs of Melbourne. So this is a site with uh, have those 77 leachate extraction pumps. And the picture I've got there on the slide is uh, one of the ponds where all that leachate is pumped to. So this treatment plant is a, it's a pretty rudimentary treatment plant, but it works. Uh, when this site started off as a sand quarry, they were quarrying deeper than the groundwater level. So they had some ponds where they were extracting groundwater to. Over the years, as it became a landfill, they lined the ponds and slowly it was upgraded and upgraded until it became its current form where it's essentially a leachate treatment plant. So it was never an initial design as such, it's just evolved over the years. So this is a three pond treatment system. Uh, the untreated leachate that comes into the ponds has an ammonia concentration around 2,000 milligrams per litre. So it's uh, at the upper end of the concentration that we see in untreated landfill leachate. The ammonia discharge criteria for this site is less than 200 milligrams per litre. So this site needs to treat it from yeah, 2,000 down to less than 200. At the moment, this site is treating around 15 megalitres per year. Uh, so that's about 10 of those ponds that we're looking at there. So the, main, the method of treatment at this site is nitrification. So the process that I've just talked through, um, the way that is achieved is the ponds have been seeded with a biomass from a municipal wastewater treatment plant. The ponds are fitted with aerators and their mechanical floating air rays that you can see there in the photo. Uh, there's regular monitoring of the water properties. So things like um, pH and testing for ammonia concentrations, etc., to monitor the process. That's all done manually at this site. None of that's automated. Uh, we do find at this site we need to add alkalinity to achieve the ammonia discharge criteria, and that's added in the form of magnesium hydroxide. Um, and then the treated leachate from this site is discharged to sewer and heads off to the um, Southeast Treatment Plant in Melbourne. So the next slide is just an aerial photo of this treatment plant. So three ponds, um, down the southern end of the site, leachate comes into the pond, first pond on the right, um, where the treatment begins. 
into the middle pond. And then the third pond on the left is the batch discharge pond. And that's the pond where we lock the pond, lock the inlets and outlets to the pond. Representative from uh, Southeast Water comes along. We sample that pond, and then once that's approved, it gets discharged as well. Next case study uh, is Woolert Landfill. I won't go into too much detail on this one. Um, it's a similar to the Clayton site, however, it's a more modern uh, treatment plant, being properly designed, <laughs> proper controls, that type of thing. This is a four pond treatment system, it was constructed in 2017. Um, again, air rays in each pond, seeded with biomass from a municipal treatment plant and discharged to sewer under a trade waste agreement with, uh, Yarra, I think it's Yarra Valley Water. Interestingly, at this site, um, as far as I'm aware, there's no dosing of um, alkalinity just due to the differing um, leachate chemistry. Um, and thanks to Daniel Fife and Evan through Coppolis from Hanson for letting me share this example. Uh, the next slide is just a aerial photo of this site again. We might just skip over that one, Richard. I'm trying to, Tyson. I think I have a slight problem. Slide is stuck. So the last um, case study I'll just mention is at the LHA treatment plant at the Kim Ricky landfill in Sydney. Um, this one is a sequencing batch reactor. So type of treatment plant that you get more in um, a wastewater treatment industry. Uh, works on the same principles as the previous plant. So it's nitrification. But being a batch reactor, it um, can be controlled far more closely, um, which means it can treat a greater volume of leachate. So this was constructed in 2018, and it treats an average of 335 kilolitres per day. So that's a um, couple of megalitres a week or 100 megalitres a year. Uh, I understand at this site, the untreated leachate ammonia concentration is a bit lower. It's around uh, 300 milligrams per litre, and they're treating it to less than 100 milligrams. Um, however, I understand they generally get down to about one milligram per litre. So that's just another example of a type of treatment plant that's out there. Um, and thanks to Stuart Dever at Kim Ricky for sharing that one. That's it for me, Richard. Tyson, that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, over to monitoring. Um, so it's really two sorts of monitoring that go hand in hand and there's a bit of an overlap between them. So you've got your compliance monitoring side of things and that's um, really driven by the regulator and you've in Victoria in particular have got an approved monitoring plan that's tied in with an audit process and that that's got a frequency of monitoring it's got the parameters laid down that you need uh, to measure and it's certainly got um, plenty of clarity in what's required in it. The second side of things the operational monitoring is a bit more ad hoc, varies completely between sites and it's really tied in with, well, how does management see they're going to, to manage their leachate and what information do they need for that? My perspective on the world is that both those uh, types of monitoring really need to be brought together. Uh, you get a lot of good intelligence um, from the operational monitoring on potential causes of things that you see in your compliance monitoring. Trouble with compliance monitoring is it's sort of typically looked at at the end of the year and uh, whereas your operational monitoring is uh, sometimes collected daily, uh, often weekly and, and so you've 
got a much better chance of managing your site and reducing environmental impacts uh, with a good operational monitoring regime. So what do we actually measure? Oh, in the world of um, leachate, there's a few different parts of the site and you've heard a lot from Tyson and seen a lot of them, um, some great case studies. Uh, where Hydroterra gets involved is measuring uh, how much leachate is moving around those various systems and where is it stored and uh, is there too much in one area or in another. So just looking at this landfill, for example, uh, you know, there's a leachate pond, Tyson showed us some good pictures of those. Things we need to measure there are things like the amount of freeboard, which is the amount of space left in the dam before it overtops. And there's a um, regulated amount of freeboard that one needs to manage to allow for, you know, problems where there might have been an accident and you need to have a bit of a buffer so you don't have leachate flowing down the side of a hill. Certainly been involved in sites where leachate has flowed down the side of hills. So these things do happen and there's good reasons why these compliance criteria in place. Um, monitoring leachate within the cell itself and the elevation of that is often a, a source of some woe for people. Um, why? Well, often it hasn't been thought about back in the old days and uh, they're sometimes a bit hard to get the infrastructure down there to really monitor them. And drilling through waste is a pretty challenging thing to do. You can get mattress springs and things curled around traditional augers. So it becomes an expensive exercise to drill holes into waste. So it's challenging. Uh, what you heard from Tyson was um, he likes incline sumps and we do work installing sensors in incline sumps. I've got a couple of pictures of some installs in those. Uh, you need to do a little bit of trigonometry when you're um, deploying pressure transducers to work out how to tie that uh, elevation back to a con common datum of like metres Australian height datum, for example. Uh, vertical sumps, um, in a way, are a bit easier for monitoring because you don't have to do the trigonometry, but they tend to have all sorts of grief associated with the fact that they're not straight up and down. Like a lot of these have got concrete rises and that sort of thing. And uh, as I think Tyson mentioned, as the, as the waste consolidates, uh, those um, you can get some pretty weird angles on what's a sort of vertical um, sum. So interesting challenges associated with that. Stormwater ponds is an important one. And, uh, you know, they're managed on site too. You've got to keep really try and keep stormwater away from leachate on these sites. So if the stormwater ponds overflow, you can create an even bigger headache for yourself. So we like to monitor stormwater levels as well. Um, so that's a few examples of how we monitor leachate on site. I just thought it would be worth touching on how many people are involved in sort of getting to a point of uh, a monitoring system on a site. Uh, I've been doing quite a few monitoring system designs for landfills recently and the number of stakeholders who are sort of involved in that process is large, right? So I thought it would be worth just discussing that. So these are all stakeholders. So you've got the site owner who's actually desperately trying to maintain their license to operate and uh, that's very important to them. And they typically engage people to help. So sometimes they'll engage uh, a contractor or another business to actually run the landfill for them. And those two parties, the site operator and the site owner, are very much joined at the hip. They need to keep this place running and they need to keep it compliant. So they need to bring in a bunch of people to help. And... Uh, You've heard from one today in Tyson, you know, these are these engineering consultants who actually design the, the systems, they design the cells. Um, sometimes I wish they'd remember to design some access tubes for us to put our various monitoring equipment in. Um, but it's certainly, uh, they do a lot of good documentation and, and put that together. Then you have people like Hydroterra who 
uh, really design monitoring systems. And we need to work closely with those engineering consultants to make sure that any infrastructure we need to deploy sensors is going to be safe in the application. Like some things to think about that come up is some sites require intrinsic safety around pressure transducers that are being used for leachate. Uh, it needs to be talked around between the various engineers to decide if that's actually required, as an example. Then we have the auditors and their role is to sort of keep an eye on everyone and make sure that our monitoring plans and the like are progressively reviewed. Sometimes it's an annual review, sometimes it's um, a bit less than annual. Uh, really that depends on the site and depends on the auditor. Um, but they play an important role in making sure we're collecting the right data. Um, and I would stress to the auditors out there that they should start thinking more about the operational data and how that can be tied into their monitoring plans better. Then we get down to really what's probably the one that determines whether or not the, the whole thing works. And these are the uh, plant operators on the site. So these are the people who run the pumps and things. And you heard from Tyson about, you know, a site with 70 pumps and that they're out there every week keeping an eye on them. It takes a lot of time and effort to keep some of these sites working. And it's often an area that's a little bit neglected by site owners and operators. So this is where I see most woe in landfills and we provide monitoring systems to keep an eye on whether or not those pumping systems, et cetera, are actually working. Um, and we can do that remotely. Um, then we have organizations like Hydroterra who actually operate the monitoring systems. And this typically is uh, around uh, having continuous monitors to keep an eye on those various aspects of leachate and what's happening on those sites. More and more there's um, capability with the telemetry and data hosting to have that real time uh, data and to have alarms associated with that. So uh, the world is, there's a lot more opportunity to get better at it, um, but there's a lot of stakeholders who need to be consulted in that process of improvement. Finally, we've got, I guess, what we call monitoring contractors. Everyone thinks they can do this, right? They really do. And their consultants will send out juniors doing a lot of manual measurements and um, sampling, that sort of thing, and dip measurements. And then you'll have the laboratories going out. They've been contracted and they'll be doing similar things. And then you'll have people like Hydroterra going out and doing these. So it drives a need for a common system uh, to bring that data together. And that's something that Hydroterra spends a lot of time doing is just getting a framework together to bring together these disparate data sets to allow more efficient monitoring of these sites. I'm um, gonna run a little bit short for time. So just gonna skip over some slides. So, when you're looking at, uh, I'll skip over that one too. When you're looking to choose various measurement devices for your landfills, there's a few things you need to keep in mind. Huh? You've got to keep in mind what you really need to measure and its frequency. Sometimes people get obsessed with measuring stuff that actually never gets used. Like a lot of monitoring data just never gets applied. So try and work against that human instinct uh, to get to, okay, how are you actually going to use a parameter? Um, then we need to decide what level of functionality we need. And uh, if it's only once a week or once a month or once a year, well, you don't really need to stick a automated system in, right? So you need to make that decision. Is it manual or is it automated? Uh, or do you just want a data logger? Uh, when would you use telemetry? We use telemetry when you need an alarm, use telemetry when it's a remote site, use telemetry when you need uh, rapid reporting. Right? Uh, so there's a number of reasons why you choose one or the other. So just on the right there, I've got some examples of you know, how you can measure depth. Say so you could measure depth down a sump or down a groundwater well. 
You can use a water level meter there with just a tape and a, a dipper on it, and it goes beep when it hits the, the depth, and you read the depth off the tape that's on it. Uh, then the one below that, they're data logging pressure transducers. You set up and program them to measure at a frequency of level measurement, and you come and manually download those. Or if you want to hook those same things up, you can hook them up to telemetry and have that data beamed back to your office. Some of the things that get in the way of an easy time for leachate monitoring are listed on the left here, these leachate characteristics. Uh, leachate does get hot, right? And uh, it can be hot within the waste because of microbial activity and the wetter the waste, typically the hotter it gets. But the second one, which um, I've discovered on a recent project is Leachate can get hot in the leachate lines because quite often they run across the surface of the caps and they get hot. Those pipes absorb the heat and you can see a sort of diurnal fluctuation uh, in the, the temperature and that affects things like the pressure in the lines because it's not just uh, leachate in the lines, there's also gas and gas is expandable. So it was quite interesting to see that as a potential impact on how we measure such things. Um, as we heard from Tyson, we use these microbes to uh, treat leachate, but they're also a problem. They clog up instrumentation. So you've got to be a bit careful what sort of instrumentation you choose. It's very easy to have them working very well at the start and clogged up at the end and not able to work. So sometimes it's good to find a contactless way to measure. Um, you have multiple contaminants of concern. We had one uh, uh, question, one of the questions was uh, what to do about PFAS. To the best of my knowledge, there isn't a real-time PFAS monitor. So I think we're sort of tied to uh, laboratory analysis around that. Um, dissolved and fugitive gases, right? So they get in the way sometimes of good measurement. Um, some of these sumps will bubble and uh, others, other leachate will have a really high level of dissolved gases in it that can affect the accuracy of instrumentation, particularly around the measurement of water quality. Um, finally, you know, the, the actual solution is pretty corrosive soup and uh, you wanna be thinking about the materials that you're uh, selecting uh, that you're gonna be putting in contact with it. Okay, so a couple of golden rules for you. Um, if you can avoid measurement instrument contact with leachate, then do so. Okay, there are quite a few non-contact ways of measuring some of the parameters we need. Um, have a look at them. So flow is a classic where you can use electromagnetic flow meters to measure flow without having to have them in contact with the leachate going down the lines, that's uh, very useful. Um, leachate sump levels, you can use bubblers or you can use ultrasonics to measure or even sonics to measure uh, level without actually contacting the leachate with any electronics. Um, and similarly uh, with leachate pond level. I've got visual there, sometimes all you need to do is have a gauging board and manually write down a level. Sometimes that's enough, right? Other times it needs to be automated. Second dot point is if we do have to have uh, contact with a leachate, let's just choose some smart materials. So we often use ceramic type uh, sensors um, or titanium sensors to avoid uh, corrosion, particularly around sort of pressure transducers. Um, some things about what goes wrong in sumps. So pumps are, pumps are buzzing away and mechanically disturbing the environment that we're trying to monitor in. And some of the devices that we have down those holes are sensitive to that. Um, so you can have vibration and you can have um, basically like electromagnetic influence from some electrical pumps, which I've seen destroy whole sensor networks. So 
Um, need to be a little bit conscious of that. A lot of sites have got pneumatic pumps these days, so that's less of a concern. But it's a good idea to keep your monitoring device separate from your pump, okay? And that means often it's good to run a casing, like well casing down the side of these vertical sumps or even, uh, even down the um, inclined sumps, just to protect the sensors. And it allows you to be able to remove them and replace them as you require, rather than pulling a whole um, uh, pulling a whole pump up to, to get your sensor. So some thought needs to go into that. Um, bubbling in sumps can cause the water level or the leachate level to be disturbed. So in those sorts of instances, it's quite good if you've got a device that's actually submerged, right? So that that's one of those things where there's a win in having it submerged, but there's a problem with uh, corrosion and that sort of thing. So worth thinking about. Um, bubblers, which um, allow you to measure the level from the surface and you have a tube down in the sumps, they're good because you can just strap the tube to the actual riser pipe of the, of the pump. So deployment can be done in conjunction with the, um, with the pump deployment and typically you don't need to remove your bubbler line. They do clog up every now and again, but uh, uh, there's various bubble units with fairly large compressors attached to them that help keep those tubes clear. Uh, a couple of things around flow, measuring flow, I'd stay away from impellers. Early on, we did a project using impellers for leachate and that didn't work forever. Um, so I, I'd be steering you towards avoiding the temptation of saving money uh, and putting in uh, EM flow meters. Um, sometimes you've got to measure very low flows, right? So sometimes we monitor lysimeters and those flows, um, uh, it's really a seepage through the, the land for cap. So technically it's not leachate because it hasn't come in contact with the waste yet, but uh, it is stuff heading towards becoming leachate. So I've rolled it into this. Um, they're very low flows, so you can actually use a little tipping bucket arrangement that the uh, flow that comes out of the lysimeter goes through and it tips uh, tips, and we count the tips and that tells us the flow rate. Um, so something to be aware of. Um, electromagnetic flow meters are expensive, but do a very good job. However, on some sites, we've found that um, you need to reduce your leachate diameter of your um, of your pipes to achieve the accuracies of flow measurement that you want. Basically, the wider the diameter of the pipe, the less accurate the uh, the flow measurements are. So sometimes there's a bit of a trade off. And you heard Tyson talking about uh, pumping leachate's great, but it brings uh, silt with it. And if you change the diameter of a pipe, it uh, it uh, is often a good spot for that um, silt and stuff to get clogged. So be aware of that little trap. Uh, you can measure inline pressure um, and that, that can be good. You just need to be careful that uh, uh, some of those sensors do get affected by leachate and clogged up and not necessarily all that reliable. Um, on one recent project, um, I did find uh, this temperature effect, which I just thought I'd put in for you, which was this diurnal effect of um, temperature during the day on the pressure readings that we're seeing within the pipes. And this was confirmed with two different sorts of technology measuring the pressure. So it is real and uh, it, it, it raises some thoughts about, okay, um, when does one read a measurement and how does that tie into compliance? but uh, worth, worth thinking about. All right, running out of time. So we're already out of time, I do apologize. I think we better just skip over the next couple other than to say there's some good technologies for monitoring stormwater and leachate ponds. Uh, this one on the right here is a 
telemetered unit with a pressure transducer and it's just buoy mounted. So it's really easy to deploy in a pond. So that's pretty good. Um, as I said before, you can use gauge boards or you can use ultrasonics, but they need to be mounted out over the top of the pond. So there's a bit more cost associated with getting them set up. If you've already got a structure coming out over the pond, then happy days, it's a good way to go. Uh, some pictures, various types of deployments. The one on the left is a bubbler unit. And uh, you see the tube coming out the bottom of that, which is going down into that leachate sump. Um, the one in the middle there is just, it's more about uh, monitoring the operation of pumps and that's a SCADA controlled system. So SCADA systems can also be hooked up to, to your monitoring data to keep track of things like pump operation, et cetera. Um, not sure what that one on the right is. It might just be pressure transducers. Uh, there's a case study. We did have a question about are there um, solar powered leachate um, systems? This is one that we installed for Macedon Ranges. And uh, we're monitoring this in real time and it's got solar pumps um, extracting that leachate um, on that site. Um, Here's an incline sump. This is up at uh, Horsham and uh, connected up to telemetry. And uh, I think that's got, yeah, it's got a bubbler deployed down that sump. Uh, that's a lysimeter. Remember I mentioned a tipping bucket uh, rain gauge being used to measure flow. That central picture there with a PVC pipe there. Um, it discharges down into that little tipping bucket rain gauge and we measure the number of tips there to give us a flow. Uh, here's an example of an EM flow meter on the left and uh, a inclined PVC casing used for stormwater pond level measurement in the middle. I'll skip over these. So on to Q&A, thanks so many people for sticking around and apologies that we've gone a little bit over time today. Um, in, in conclusion, there's a lot to land for leachate management with many stakeholders. Engineering design needs to be practical and meet regulatory requirements. Land for leachate management needs a diverse range of knowledge to cover design, leachate reticulation and treatment. I think we've found in Tyson, someone who has got their head around all of those aspects, which is really impressive. Leachate monitoring considerations need to be assessed against the operational and compliance need. Leachate and electronics don't always get along, so deployment methods and technology selection are important. And that's where HydroTerra is here to help. Now, just so you Tyson and myself have addressed the early bird questions. How is leachate best assessed and treated for emerging contaminants, including PFAS? I would have said it's best assessed by grabbing samples for laboratory analysis. Uh, it's not going to be sort of continuous sensors in the short term. Uh, Tyson, do you agree with that or? Yeah, I agree with that. That's the only real option is lab testing. Um, and then on the treatment side, uh, I'm not aware of any sites that have treatment for PFAS or such, but it is possible there may be sites out there. In terms of the next one, I mentioned briefly about solar, but uh, can you think of other standalone options that you've seen where uh, they don't have mains power and they're needing to extract leachate? Um, solar is the only one I can think of. Uh, the only other option is some sites are designed, particularly older valley style landfills. So leachate drains via gravity from the landfill into a pond. Um, common on older landfills. Yeah, I've been impressed with some sites where they do achieve effectively 
leachate transfer with no pumps, um, just using that drainage. Um, best practice in management of leachate construction well collapse due to waste settlement. Okay, so that's a problem you raised. Um, what do you think you should um, do to fix that one, Tyson? There's no way of getting around it. The few things you can do are making sure your wells are made of suitable um, class of pipe. So generally pretty thick walled pipe. Um, make sure that you know it's a good installation, nice straight wells, these sort of things. So if they're not straight to start with, you're only going to um, make things worse. Another one I'll mention is um, avoid stockpiling large amounts of soil on your cap because it uh, preloads it and makes it settle more and makes these things worse. I think you covered the next one. Um, oh, sorry, uh, I'll skip one. Any tips on recording accurate standing leachate levels in wide sumps? Uh, Look, yeah, I think I mentioned them though. Look, putting a casing down the side of a sump is a good idea um, for a few reasons. So that's that's one way of dealing with that. Um, common issues encountered with leachate collection systems and rises. I think Tyson's uh, presentation covered that one, as did the one about best practice liners. Um, here's a good one. When can environmental monitoring be stopped for legacy landfills? It's, uh, it's an interesting question. In Victoria, it's sort of tied in with um, an auditor's program of review. Um, but Tyson, I'd be interested in further, if you've got further take on that. How long is a piece of string? <laughs> um, the, the best practice guidelines in Victoria refer to a period of about 30 years, um, but really, we don't know. <laughs> um, I think what we do know is that over time, the amount of monitoring, the number of bores, frequency of monitoring can be reduced as the risk profile of the site reduces. But when you completely stop, it's going to vary site by site. That's a good answer. So the next one, what have you found to be the most beneficial drilling method to access and collect? Leachate. Yep. Um, the most common method there is called a bucket drill rig. Um, so this is a type of drill rig that I think is also common in um, things like piling. Um, but essentially, it's got a large diameter auger. It's a rotary type of drill rig. Um, and essentially, the, the auger forms like a bucket. So it collects the waste or drill cuttings in this bucket. That bucket is pulled out and emptied and then reinserted back down the borehole and that process is just repeated. That's the most common one. Um, the other drilling method that's commonly used more for monitoring bores is um, sonic. So sonic drilling has the ability to drill through a big range of uh, materials. In terms of uh, that side of things, do you see many people retrofitting wells to, to extract leachate? Uh, retrofitting? Yeah. Oh, sorry, re putting them in, you know, so it's, it's been Oh, yeah, times. definitely. Yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of drilling into waste happening, um, particularly over the last oh, 10 years or so as EPA started to have more of a focus on these um, older landfill sites, at least here in Victoria, where EPA's gone around and put pollution abatement notices on sites and required them to you know, essentially go and extract leachate. So there's been a lot of lot of this happening. So I think touching on that same one, leachate monitoring for closed landfills. Well, obviously there's a lot of that going on. I think we've sort of touched on when that might come to an end. Um, in many ways, it's not dissimilar to when it's operating in terms of groundwater. Uh, leachate monitoring tends to continue as well. Um, do you have anything further to add to that? Uh, no, I think you've covered it. Um, lastly, on this set, how does leachate treatment and disposal embrace the principles of a circular economy? Are there valuable resources in 
leachate? I like this question. Um, every waste is potentially a resource, isn't it? Um, so yes, there would be valuable resources in leachate. I guess the issue is it's full of all different contaminants and how do you separate that out? So, you know, leachate is, a lot of it's essentially fertilizer. You've got lots of nitrogen in there, um, but that comes along with the salt and the metals and the PFAS. So I'm not aware of any process that can um, you know, separate that all out. I guess using it for dust suppression is one yep. benefit. Okay, quickly on to q and I think um, we'll give it five more minutes and then we will need to round it up. We've given you an extra 15. So uh, uh, apologies for those whose questions we don't get to. Um, given the heterogeneous nature of landfills, how can one obtain a representative sample for risk assessment and design purposes? Do you want me to answer that one, Richard? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> um, I don't know if the question's in relation to leachate levels or chemistry. Um, in terms of chemistry, in my opinion, I don't think it really matters too much. You know, we can take a few samples from different locations on the site and get an idea of what's in the leachate. But generally before we test it, we already know what we're going to find. There's going to be high TDS, ammonia, metals, these things. They're the things we're looking for in groundwater, downgrading to the site to look for contamination. Leachate levels are uh, a bit trickier. You need more, lots of wells across the site. Um, landfills are quite compartmentalized. So your leachate level isn't consistent across the site. It can be very variable. So yeah, lots of wells. It's a good question. Uh, in terms of your levels varying as you drill lots of, what do you take as your compliance level there, Tyson? Like, um, and how do you deal with perching that's above the, the liner, for example? Um, so a line landfill, I guess, as long as you've got, in my opinion, less than 300 mil at the sump, well, above the line of the sump, which is the EPA compliance requirement, then it actually doesn't matter if there's perching in the landfill because that's not a head on the liner. So it's not increasing the um, seepage rate through the liner. Unlined landfills, it's, yeah, it's a bit tricky. You just need um, several wells and I'm aware of sites where there's different compliance levels for different wells, um, you know, Upgrading of the site, you might have a higher level and downgrading where groundwater levels are lower, you might have a lower compliance level. Makes sense. Next question. Regarding leachate, is there any kind of rule of thumb about the proportion of leachate which is generated by waste breaking down versus infiltration of stormwater? I'm wondering if leachate management can include upgrading landfill caps to reduce infiltration e.g. increasing evapotranspiration, planting of phytocap, et cetera, or perhaps infiltration isn't a significant part of leachate. I, I can talk to that one. Um, so phytocaps uh, are a, uh, a great invention that were very popular sort of, uh, I reckon nearly uh, sort of 18 years ago or so. And we used to do a lot of modeling of theoretical um, evapotranspiration that could be uh, achieved and we would design the thickness of the landfill caps to, to sort of uh, act as a sponge to accommodate infiltration and, and it was based on daily sort of time step modelling, um, unsaturated zone modelling. So in theory they work well but in practice, what we've found is that maintaining vegetation has been the challenge and um, it's the vegetation that's the key to success of phytocaps. And uh, really it probably comes down to some of um, Tyson's pictures there of the rainfall distribution in Australia and okay, how, how easy is it to actually maintain that, um, 
a vegetation layer. Uh, so the second part of this is um, what contribution does stormwater make? Well, it's very variable and it depends on how the cap's been designed in the first place. Um, but on quite a few sites I've seen, uh, there's a real correlation between uh, infiltration and your leachate being generated and people can spend a fortune on um, disposing of leachate because they haven't spent enough on their capping at the beginning. So it's really important, that one. Um, I agree with all that, Richard. Um, ET caps, good in theory. In practice, as I said, very hard to get right managing the vegetation. If you want to minimise your leachate generation, geomembrane cap. Membrane cap, is that what you said? Yes, yeah, geomembrane. Geomembrane. Uh, next one, do they ever link the burning off of landfill gas to use that heat to assist with leachate evaporation? That's a good question. Yes, there are systems out there, um, but I haven't been involved with one, but they definitely do exist. Okay, we'll keep going. I'm enjoying this. <laughs> what, what is the end game of leachate monitoring if there's not downstream receptor? Are there any landfills where monitoring is no longer required? Uh, I'm not aware of many where they've closed it off and said that's the end. Um, it's a really good question. Um, there's a lot of those lists of um, landfills which are unlicensed across the state, which there's very little monitoring activity going on, but they are still on the books of the various councils and things as liabilities. Um, so I'm not sure, Tyson, do you have a bit more of a taste, take on I like this question too. Often we just monitor because that's what you do. We're not, we're not thinking, oh, where's the receptor? Is there any need to monitor this? And in my experience, a lot of these particularly small old landfills, but even some of the very worst landfills, the groundwater impacts actually don't go that far. And particularly for a lot of the um, contaminants like your nitrogens, your ammonias, they do naturally attenuate. Um, so I agree, I think there can be more thought in, does this need to be monitored? Is there actually a receptor? Is there an impact? rather than just monitoring the life out of everything. The thing is, I suppose, Tyson, is it's a fair bit of effort to prove up that natural attenuation and then you've got to monitor that, right? So uh, it might be a bit of a circular argument. Um, next question, I think we'll make this the last one. Has anyone had experience with WAIV units, especially in colder climates? Do you know what that is? I don't actually know what that is. WAIV. No, I'm not familiar with, what was it, WAIV? No. I think, um, I think we'll skip over that question then. We've got time for one more. Uh, any example of site using leachate re-injection system? Yes, I've uh, been involved with one that's uh, been recirculating leachate for many years. Um, not sure how popular it is anymore, the recirculation of leachate though. Um, I think it, I'm thinking of alert as recirculation. Yeah, that's a um, key one in Victoria at least that's done it on a more formal basis. Um, there's plenty of other sites that have done it sort of less formally. Uh, but yeah, what we call that when leachate's re-injected is a bioreactor landfill. And really the theory of a bioreactor is to speed up the breakdown of waste. So you actually speed up your waste breakdown, your generation of gas is sped up. So in theory, you're getting to that end point when you can stop managing and monitoring this landfill faster. That's the theory behind it. Um, there are lots of considerations for a bioreactor, such as you've got higher temperatures, which reduces the life of the geomembrane in your liner, uh, things like that. And we found at these sites like Wallert, you can't just keep pumping around in circles, you will need to extract some leachate. 
All right. Look, I think we better call it a day, Tyson. We'll email the uh, answers through to the remaining questions. Um, many thanks to everyone uh, for attending, and great to see so many people still online now. So. It's tremendous to have such a good audience. And uh, a big thank you to you, Tyson. That was really informative and, uh, and really impressive knowledge there. So thanks very much. No problem. Thanks for the opportunity.